Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Luke, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Thanks, Robert. Good to be here. Great to have you back. Uh, We are going deeper into Jordan Peterson's book, Maps of Meaning. We're still in the very lengthy chapter four. Uh, This time, looking at the broad headings, the revolutionary hero and the rise of self-reference. Um, before we jump in today, should we do a little recap of how we got to here? Yeah, quick one. I, I mean, the, the chapter four has been all about this, the idea of anomaly dealing with things that are unexpected, essentially. Mm-hmm. And these two headings you're talking about, the revolutionary hero is supposed to be this last category of, of things that are anomalous. So there was the strange thing, the mm-hmm. stranger, strange person, mm-hmm. and the strange idea. Mm-hmm. But the revolutionary hero is is sort of something outside of that. It's it's an anomaly, but it fixes the anomaly. So we're going to dig into this dualistic thing here. And then the chapter is, is hopefully going to wrap up nicely with the idea of self-reference. And I, I like to call that individuation. So not to get ahead of ourselves exactly, but the the point of the chapter, I think, to tie it all in is how do you become an individual after you've become socialized, after you figured out how the world works? Mm. And then what are the implications for actually becoming a, a real self, a real self? Yeah, just mm. to, to put it like that. So mm. I'm, I'm excited for this one. Yeah, so after conforming to the world and becoming socialized, how do you then disconform in some respect and become individualized without becoming totally disconformed? Um and therefore right. being valuable to the society from which you come from. That's the key point, because yeah. I, I think the entire thing here is that it's difficult to become an individual and yeah. there's a lot of responsibility and it's a difficult path. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you might think that everyone does it, right? Mm-hmm. We're all people, we're all individuals, but not everyone goes down the path of becoming a fully self, uh, self I, um, I'm losing the word. Actualized. I, Self-actualized, thank yeah. you. Fully self-actualized individual, exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. Uh, mom and grandma's wisdom sort of rings true here, right? Where they just say, oh, just be yourself. Just be yourself. Sounds so easy, but obviously uh, much easier said than done. Okay, so I will read, I guess, to get us started. This is kind of a slightly long excerpt, and then it concludes with, 
a quote from someone else. It's not Peterson. So I'll, I'll mention that as I transition. So Peterson writes, shamanism is devoted to furtherance of the possibility of qualitative improvements in consciousness or general adaptive ability. It has captured the essence of such possibility in image to minimize the accompanying terror. Shamanism is prototypical of those religious practices designed to modify human behavior and interpretation, to induce and regulate the processes of spiritual reconfiguration. These practices are not merely cultural in nature, they originate in the observation of spontaneous psychological transmutation, a psychobiologically grounded human capacity. Shamanic rituals are therefore not merely anachronistic without modern relevance, except as curiosity dictates, but prime exemplars of a process we must come to understand. The shaman is not simply an archaic figure, an interesting anomaly from the dead past. He is the embodiment in cultures we do not comprehend of those people we admire most in the past. The phenomenon of the quote unquote creative illness described in detail by Henry Ellenberger in his massive study of the history of, of the unconscious is alive and well in our own culture. Ellenberger described its characteristic elements. And this goes into the Ellenberger quote. A creative illness succeeds a period of intense preoccupation with an idea and search for a certain truth. It is a polymorphous condition that can take the shape of depression, neurosis, psychosomatic ailments, or even a psychosis. Whatever the symptoms, they are felt as painful, if not agonizing, by the subject with alternating periods of alleviation and worsening. Throughout the illness, the subject never loses the thread of his dominating preoccupation. It is often compatible with normal professional activity and family life. But even if he keeps to his social activities, he is almost entirely absorbed within himself. He suffers from feelings of utter isolation, even when he has a mentor who guides him through the ordeal, like the shaman apprentice with his master. The termination is often rapid and marked with a phase of exhilaration. The subject emerges from his ordeal with a permanent transformation of his personality and the conviction that he has discovered a great truth or a new spiritual world. Um, so <laughs> I couldn't help but think, uh, of this being something like the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Like we've Bitcoiners have actually been called psychopaths, um, which was a, uh, a name that they sort of adopted for themselves, right? Toxic psychopathic Bitcoiners. And it, I have, you know, personally experienced this disintegration of what you took for granted previously and you're sort of left picking up the pieces like, okay, none of this was real. So what is real? You have to go a level deeper and you have to reconfigure your understanding of the world. And so this entire, but as he says, at the end, you leave with, you leave transformed, right? You have the conviction that you've discovered a great truth. Um, so anyways, I don't mean to sabotage this with Bitcoin conversation, but I couldn't help but notice that this is much like the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It's a fantastic example and a yeah, great connection there. And and I mean, the, the parallel, I think, definitely works because the thing here is that it's a painful process realizing that the entire system around you is a lie. A scam. <laughs> a scam. Yeah. Exactly. And so, oh, yeah, I, I, I hadn't even gone there. It's it's a great parallel. It's perfect. And and I mean, does that imply that everyone who actually properly goes down the Bitcoin rabbit hole is is doing this process of self-actualization and individuation i think so that's pretty cool well the it would sound totally outlandish if the proof weren't so in the pudding i mean everyone i know that goes into this rabbit hole starts seeing changes in their life and they're all i mean they're all different but the flavor is roughly the same right people they start identifying areas in their life where they were weak or they wanted to improve and they start improving those areas. So, you know, it's usually less drinking, you know, more working out, less partying, more family life, less nihilism, more 
uh, optimism. I don't want to say religion per se, although it does lead some to religion. Meaning could um, work. Meaning. There you go. Yeah. From less, from nihilism to more meaningful existence. And I don't know, who, who knows how much of that is rooted in just creating a more hopeful future by giving people um, better control over their own fruits of their own labor. But then, but that's not enough. It's also this disintegration, right? Where you've, the educational process of learning about Bitcoin makes you ask fundamental questions, questions, disintegrates your understanding that you took for granted previously. So you, you leave the experience transformed psychologically as well as holding a tool that gives you better keys to your own future, something like that. Yeah, it's somewhere where the payoff is concrete to the extent that Bitcoin is concrete. But the 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 idea of the shaman generally as well was the person who lives the closest to that gap between the order and the chaos, the mundane and the spiritual, yeah. right? And the thing the edge is... The Overton nothing... window, to use a scientific term. Sure. And 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 the thing was, this this wasn't at all a thing that everyone did, right? Mm -hmm. The society needed people to specialize, essentially, mm -hmm. to to do the things that were necessary for the society to survive. And one of those specializations was this spiritual figure. Shaman is a, a Central Asian term, generally refers to Central Asian or some some far Northern European cultures as well that that have this specific figure he's got a drum and and wears antlers on his head mm -hmm. stuff like that and 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 does <laughs> does fun fun rituals uh maybe involving psychedelics something like that at least that's sort of the image but the 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 idea i think is universal that there is always some kind of mediator in societies that only reach a certain level and i don't want to imply necessarily that this role becomes obsolete, but maybe it becomes less. It, it becomes less required to be to be such so specific, mm. uh, because as as religion moves on, then there becomes a sort of an organized priesthood, and there mm -hmm. becomes a mediator between a defined god, and maybe things are written down. But in in cultures across the world that that are uh, seemingly have no no link other than just just being human there's some kind of figure of the the spiritual mediator and i was talking to and i know you've talked to him to uh, alexander bard um mm -hmm. about this um he he's got this idea of the the shamanoid he he calls it it's essentially a personality type someone who mm -hmm. operates within the edge all the edges and they're the people who are supposed to mediate between societies mm -hmm. they're the ones who who do all the things playing around the edges and and mm -hmm. they can go out and and do these things while leaving the society at home to to thrive in their their social situation right and so mm -hmm. th this is the the point i'm actually kind of getting at here is that th this is sort of a universal throughout cultures but it's also not something that everyone was drawn to and and so one thing that i found difficult about this chapter is that Taking this exact example as the individual, so to say, or the the goal of the revolutionary hero, it puts a, a bit of a difficult burden on any given person to to say that you have to do something like this. I don't want to imply that everyone has to be this sort of spiritual yeah. mediator, right? But you take it to the next level down. Yeah, at least the 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 point here is to to. Uh, at least go to the edge of comfortable, mm. the edge of yeah. the known kind of thing. So yeah, I'll just pause there. No, that's a fantastic point. And it's, again, this is the division of labor, right? We all need to specialize in some domain and then cooperate so that we can all enjoy the fruits of one another's specialization. We don't all need to be shamans. Just like we don't all need to be warriors or poets or engineers. You know, we, we need a little bit of every everything and everyone. Um, but perhaps this learning would be useful and that the next time you look at someone as completely foolish, well, just think maybe there's that little possibility that they do know something that you haven't figured out yet, right? Maybe they are, you know, we're in the year 2024, this guy that you consider foolish today in the year 2050 might be considered a savior, 
So just to withhold that little shard of humility that you might not know it all and you may have written someone off that you should not have, um, I think is useful for everyone, no matter what your station in life. Absolutely agree. And I mean, the thing here is that the the process that this is is pointing to is this sort of dual death thing, right? Mm-hmm. That, that the the way you get to these unique points of knowledge is by a second spiritual death and rebirth, mm-hmm. right? We we talked in in previous episodes. I, I'm now even thinking this was at least two episodes ago about the <laughs> about the uh, the way that someone becomes socialized. So mm-hmm. you, you go from the 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 base uh, child and becoming uh, socialized into the world of, of adulthood through a, a symbolic death, mm-hmm. right? And rebirth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't work if you don't have the rebirth. Yeah. But then the idea is you have to have a voluntary contact with the the unknown, with the underworld, mm-hmm. and then emerge out of that. And what you take from that voluntary contact with the unknown, with the chaos, that's the unique thing, the yes. unique special point of knowledge that is unique about that person. And mm. it doesn't have to be knowledge either. I think I think I just want to be clear on that. It's the the contact with the unknown is just what makes you you. Yes. I think that's the way to put it. For sure. And w- without it, without it, without it, you're just someone who's one of the crowd essentially i don't want to i don't mean that in a derogatory way exactly but it's it's more like there is no there is no accomplishment without without some difficulty right yeah perfectly well said and that yeah this contact with the chaos of the unknown right the actual trials and tribulations of your life these define your individuality Right? Because they're experiences that are presumably unique unto you. Maybe not entirely, but in this in the specificity of the experience, absolutely unique unto you. Right? No one's lived your exact life, walked in your exact shoes, seen the world through your exact eyes, etc. And I guess this also points to why I can't think of anyone, a, a person of high achievement or someone that's highly regarded that hasn't had a rocky path of some kind, right? And that rocky path typically comes out in their story about themselves and their lives, right? Like it defined them. It made them who they are. Had they not overcome this significant challenge, they would not be where they are today. So it is that, and and there, this is a theme we'll, we continue to visit, but it's like the, the known, right? The civilization, the culture, the pre-established patterns of being, very useful and built up over time through many of these individual individuals touching the unknown and bringing some lessons back into that core to build it up over time. You are like the latest iteration of that process. Um, that is, it, it is, it is information basically in formation, right? Like the, you go out into the unknown, you touch something that the culture did not previously understand. Maybe and you put yourself in a new formation, and if it's a useful formation, then you set an example for other people to put themselves in new formations, and culture grows as a result. Now, of course, this isn't this isn't error proof, right? It doesn't mean every time you touch something in the unknown or do something new that you're just going to create a cultural change. That's actually very low probability. But this process, again, that's why most of the most the fool is the precursor to the savior. And probably the the most pioneers end up being fools, but the few that are saviors are so important to the whole human enterprise that you can't dispense with the fool. Like the cost of the fools is totally acceptable for the benefit of the saviors. It's kind of like a VC portfolio, all right? You you bet in a hundred companies, ninety fail, nine break even, one does a ten thousand x, something like that. It's like that for civilization and cultural growth uh, and the accumulation of knowledge, basically. I mean, it's the Pareto principle in action, right? Mm-hmm. That that principle is, is everywhere. You know, it's in it's in the way trees form in the yes. in the forest, right? The the, the uh, it, it's it's everywhere. There's no escaping it. I think the the point of that is is 
understanding that there are some fundamental things about the world that, that can't be changed. It's reality. Some things can't be flattened out. There are yeah. just going to be outliers who who do the most work to achieve the most, yes. right? And those things are what advances humanity. And mm -hmm. we can't pretend that everyone is exactly the same because that's not For sure. true. For that's sure. not true. Yeah. Yeah, and then you celebrate excellence, right? Whether that's athletic performance, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, whatever domain someone is excelling in like we should celebrate that it doesn't mean it's not to diminish those that do not achieve it we you know we celebrate michael jordan that doesn't mean like we're all shaming ourselves for not being able to dunk from the free throw line <laughs> we're just celebrating this feat of human achievement it's like wow look what this guy can do um it doesn't diminish humanity i think it enhances our humanity it enhances our everything right like uh our celebration of life our ability to understand ourselves more deeply, our ability to have more economic prosperity, all of the things we aim at, this process advances those aims. Exactly. And I, I, I like your point about celebrating each achievement. The, this, is, this is a point, like the, the participation trophy era. Mm -hmm. Kids, yeah, kids so. get a trophy just for participating, yeah. you know? I mean, I grew up in that basically, and 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 the thing was, it, you shouldn't get a trophy just for participating. I, I I do think, and and as a new parent, I'm thinking about this. I I think kids should be, uh, should be applauded for for putting in an honest effort. Mm -hmm. That that of course, because sure. I I think the thing that participation trophies did away with was that you didn't have to try. That mm -hmm. was the problem. Mm -hmm. But the the person who does the best should be rewarded for that and everyone else should strive to be that yes. and and if everyone is striving to be the best they can be in everything well then we all benefit yes. and to, to tie that back to bitcoin a little bit all of the all of the efforts towards bitcoin all of the successes within bitcoin we all benefit from that and and as bitcoin makes the world a better place as well by by replacing the fiat system Mm. Everyone benefits, not just the the Bitcoiners, not the people holding Bitcoin, but yeah. everyone benefits from the financial system becoming a little bit less insane. I won't say more fair because that's not true. Fairness isn't the goal. Fairness isn't the end point of Bitcoin. It's more fair from the perspective of it's not being distorted anymore, but it's it's not fair to imply that everyone is going to get the, the same out of it at the end. Oh, it, for sure. This is, yeah. gets into equality of outcome versus opportunity versus... I think both we've hammered on this with Svetsky yeah. on the show. Maybe we've mentioned it too, but equality yeah. of opportunity and outcome are basically both bullshit for reasons I won't go into now. We've done it before. The only equality we want are is equality in the eyes of the law, which is to say equal rules and equal a level playing field. And then you want uneven outcomes, right? Like to the Michael Jordan example, the game, the rules of basketball don't really change. Right? Those are fixed for all players to excel or not excel within. And then in that fixed rule set, you can measure overperformance like Michael Jordan, right? In, in terms of how many points he scores, rebounds, assists, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we want in every competitive domain, especially markets, right? Which advance actual human uh, technological prowess, economic prosperity, et cetera. And that's what we haven't had up until this point for Bitcoin. Bitcoin's like the first level playing field for economic games and it's not zero sum right and no, because it, it is a competition exactly. it's more positive sum the more fixed the rules are yes great great point yeah mm -hmm. well said because if you can fight the, <laughs> to change the rules something i've said repeatedly if i can if i can win the rule making power i can win forever so that is a zero sum game like people will fight to the death for the power to control the rules but if we discover something like a rule set that nobody can control, well, that's potentially very uh, peaceful. Yeah, this, is, this is an interesting point, and and this, I I just went there with the with this. By the way, this isn't prepped. Uh, the, why do people want power anyway? If if it if it already goes beyond the the basic needs, and I mean, I think loads of loads of what we. T I, I'm not I'm not saying that either rhetorically or or in mm -hmm. in the sense that that's a genuine question the 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 
I think a lot of what we've talked about get, gets into this, right? Is that there's there's just a desire to make more order out of the world around you, and mm-hmm. and there's just going to be people who who figure out how to play these games, and and then there's always another game, right? When yeah. you get someone who has a billions of fiat tokens and resources at their disposal, mm-hmm. what's the game? Where else can they go? They, right. they they've won to a certain extent, but there's just nothing, there's nothing left. And so they have to keep playing. Right. Sure. And, and part of that I think is, is also this, this, uh, this fiat economy, the, the system where they can, they can rig it to their own benefit, whether by being directly close to the, to the money printer or by marshalling resources that are more yeah. than other people can, can manage. Um, and, and well, I get back to Bitcoin is that it fixes that it fixes the ability mm-hmm. to, to change the rules. Right. So I yeah. hope that, and what do you, what do you think? No, I agree. And it sort of gets back to the participation trophies because when you get to that point, when a player can change the rules of the game, the game degenerates. Of course. Right. Of course. Like if we sit down to play a game, if we sit down to play poker and I can change the hand rankings arbitrarily every hand. Well, I'm going to win every hand, and you're going to get up and walk away pretty soon. Like, you can't win. Why would you play the game? You're going to go play with someone else. Um, and so, yeah, in that sphere where people have won, then they don't have any other outlet for their competitive energies. What else can they do? It's like, well, they can just keep playing the political game, right? How do I control the rules? How do I control, how do I get more tax revenues? You know, it's a, it's a very nasty it has a very nasty outcome whereas if there was a fixed rule set that that wasn't even in question it'd be like well i can the only way i can continue to win is to continue to create valuable goods and services for people that's how i can continue to expand my net worth i can't take it from other people i can't bend the rules to my favor so anyways not to belabor the point but it, it keeps first place trophies relevant in economic games Whereas the ability to change the rules of the game destroys the game and you end up with, I don't know this. I don't know where the cultural sickness of participation trophies come from, comes from Uh, the whole wokeism thing, you know, everyone's equal and it's it's a, it's a cultural Marxism thing ultimately, right? It's, I agree with we're all the same. It's all good. Don't, no one needs to excel. No one needs to stand out. The state will take care of everything. You know, no need to compete, no need to speak out. And it's just all bullshit. Ultimately, you're fine the way you are. You're fine just the way you are. I I don't like that at all. Uh, Mm. It's not okay to just be exactly who you are in one moment. That's it. Might be okay in that moment, and yeah, no one should be should be shamed for their characteristics. What makes them them? No one should be shamed for that. But that doesn't mean that that person is the person you should be going into the future. Yeah. No, yeah. no, there's there's always better, right? And yeah. and I mean for all who, of us. All of us. For all of us. Even the Michael Jordans. He's all like and that's what defines him actually. It's like he's always yeah. pushing to get better. All that's his number one characteristic. He's always pushing himself and pushing those around him. And the and the the message of that, right? We we should be we should be idolizing idolizing the Michael Jordans exactly the way we are, I think. Uh, yeah. And and not saying that that you can you can just be you and that's okay. And it just leads to stagnation. And 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 then you and then you get this whole generation of kids that that can't figure out why they haven't gone anywhere in life. Exactly. It's my generation to a certain extent, but definitely the definitely the ones after me. Definitely anyone born after the year two thousand basically is having having trouble now. And yeah, it's 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 tough. Of, of course there's exceptions. There's there's some fantastic sure. young people, fantastic, who are doing very well sure. and doing accomplished things but as a generation it's 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 scary i hope we can um yeah we're i think we're not we it's the yeah. incentives have led them astray to some extent right as we're not celebrating excellence to the extent that we could be or should be and instead we're celebrating things like you know quality of outcome opportunity body positivity uh, you know just it doesn't make sense it's like we're, we should all aspire to be better that's how we become better um, and I, and I hope we can turn it around, right? To to yeah. actually value those things, so that so that someone born in the year twenty twenty four can can have a shot, at least better that that they can 
uh, that the cultural milieu around them mm-hmm. is, is something that that is conducive to success. Yes, for those who, who are willing to to do the work to take it. Well, that's where I think the value from these ancient stories comes into play. It's like this is what you are. Humans have been doing this from the dawn of time. So long as we've been observing and writing and talking about ourselves, this is what we do. That is what you are. You know, forget whatever cultural milieu you're currently in, look deeper, right? Look at your genetic heritage, look at your ancestry, look at what your ancestors have overcome to get you to this point, to live in the lap of modern luxury that you live in. Um, Have some respect for that and then contribute, right? Yes, absolutely. And and I mean, maybe to to try and pull us back in here to, to the, to the book discussion, Uh, the, I, th- I think the 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 lessons here that we've been talking about and and that are coming up in this chapter it's it's some hard stuff. This isn't easy. the mm. The path for someone who who wants to actually do something meaningful with their life and and this is is on any level, right? Going from nihilism to meaning is is it's a zero to one thing. It's difficult. It's actually yeah. difficult. Yeah. And and doing it as an individual is is even more so because because like we heard before, society can provide that meaning, but yeah. you can stop there. You can stop there. If you want to go beyond that, then it's it's a difficult, a difficult process. And and like you were talking about with the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole being the one example, mm. this this disintegration and reintegration, they're they're important steps and well, basically, I think the the rest of this chapter gets into the the things that need to happen for for this to work. Some some examples of how this this happens in mythology and religion, and mm-hmm. then gets into a little bit of the the downside is the wrong word, but more like the the hidden secret that can't be avoided. That, mm-hmm. um, lurks underneath uh, in the in the background and uh, becoming an individual reveals yes yeah kind of an ominous foreshadowing there but definitely an important revelation um i'll read another excerpt here i'm on page 277 but before something that was coming up as you're saying that is this old saying that every man dies twice you know the the last breath that he draws and then the last time his name is spoken Yes. Um, and so I think maybe nihilism is excessively focusing on your own first death, right? You're so worried about the end of your own life and what that means to you. Whereas meaning is found in focusing more on your second death, right? Like whose lives are you impacting? When is the last time your name will be spoken? What contribution are you making to those people around you in a way that will cause them to speak your name beyond your grave um, man i wanted to end on this i actually wanted to end on this but I, this oh, is exactly did i ruin it sorry no 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 you didn't <laughs> you didn't ruin it at all i i think this is fantastic shows we're we're on in the same wavelength here the the quote is from the the norse book of wisdom attributed to odin mm. called the havamal mm. and this verse goes, cattle die, kinsmen die, all men are mortal. But I know one thing that never dies, the glory of the great dead. Mm. Now that's a, that's a mm. mismatch of translations, but yeah. I love it. The point is that the wealth and friends, they can fall away. Mm-hmm. Everyone is mortal, absolutely but it's the legacy that mm. lives on. Yes. And I wanted to I wanted to bring up that quote specifically because this is just something that's out of left field, you know. Yeah. It's it's something out of the the Vikings. This is this is uh not what you would think necessarily that that someone would uh, would get that, but yes. yeah, it shows it shows the universality of it. Yeah. That's beautiful. No, I've never heard that, but that's fantastic. Um and glory this comes, I heard this secondhand from Jordan Bush, which I think comes from some Christian text, which I can't cite, but he says glory is translated as something like the amplification of one's actions through attention. 
So mm. it's those actions, you know, so the glory of the great dead, as you said, is like the dead that took the actions that most advanced the species in whatever respect, those are the actions we want to mythologize and repeat and imitate and carry forward yeah. until we figure out, you know, something even better, right? That's, that is the process. It's this, this sort of like this static dynamic dichotomy, right? There's this, there's a static accumulation of lessons and wisdom, how to approach the world. And then, but we always have to operate at the edges because the world's always changing and we need to enrich that, that, that storehouse of knowledge over time. And that's the process we're talking about. So hey, hey, I, I know, I know you like, I know you like the language stuff. I, I, I just want to make sure, cause you, you hit on the, the, the glory word. Mm-hmm. So the, the actual word in the old Norse is, is domr. And the closest English word to that is doom. Mm. And so, so the reason I didn't, I didn't say doom, but uh, one way you could say it, the, the doom of each one dead there, there are mm. like six or seven translations. They all try to do this poetic mm. thing with it. Uh, but, but it's, it's the ultimate judgment. It's, it's like the ultimate mm. legacy. So, so glory is one thing, right? But mm-hmm. one thing to remember is that whatever is the last thing you leave is what you're going to be remembered by. Mm. And, and I don't mean that in the sense of that, that, okay, your exact last act is going to be the thing, but it's just, sure. it's just the impression you give off to the world at the very end. Yeah. That's, that's going to be it. And it's important to remember that. And the, the distinction is, is, um, massive i think it, so it's the, the positives get remembered but also the negatives they do they do i would i agree with that with the perhaps slight modification that i think there is a little bit of forgiveness that humanity tends to focus on your most salient contribution you know you look at someone like steve jobs who was a notorious asshole to work with you know, not not a fun guy by many people's personal accounts but he's largely remembered for making this giant technological contribution to the human race, you know? So there's some leeway. I don't want to give people the sense that, you know, the last act and is that's it, <laughs> but no, yeah. sure. And, and I don't, I don't want that either, but I think that, I think the point there is more like when, when someone dies, I think the, the picture becomes clear. It's static. And, yeah. And static. Right. And, yeah. and, and the thing is, I, I think there are some things that can be overriding as in, um, yes perpetrators of genocide for example are probably always going to be remembered for that not necessarily for exactly. the, the uh, donations to animal hospitals exactly exactly the most salient um i guess contribution or discontribution whatever the opposite of a contribution is to culture is what you're probably going to be remembered for if you are a business owner or manager you should know these three numbers 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, 1, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash what is money. I'm going to read an excerpt on page. This is my PDF, page 277. I remember ours are slightly off. This is on the dual death of the revolutionary hero. Uh, and there's a, there's a depiction in the book of this process, but I'll read the excerpt. Those who undergo a second initiation suffer more deeply and profoundly from life than their peers. They are, in Jung's phrase, the most, quote-unquote, complex and differentiated minds of their age. These creative individuals detect emergent anomaly and begin the process of adaptation to it long before the average person notices any change whatsoever in circumstance. In his ecstasy, the shaman lives the potential future life of his society. 
this dangerous individual can play a healing role in the community because he has suffered more through experience than his peers. If someone in the community or the community itself becomes ill, breaks down, begins the journey, so to speak, to the land of the dead, the terrible unknown, the shaman is there to serve as guide, to provide rationale for current experience, to reunite, reunite the suffering individual with his community, or to renew the community. To restabilize the paradigmatic context of expectation and desire within which individual and social experience remains tolerable. Um, I was reminded here of those memes you may or may not see, you may have may may or may not have seen on the internet, where it shows a guy doing something pretty incredible or high tech or smooth, like some kind of smooth action, and says this guy is living in 2050, like the year 2050. And that's kind of what we're a, a tongue in cheek way of what we're alluding to here, right? It's like there's someone that's figuring out something way before the rest of us figure it out. That is this revolutionary hero slash shaman uh, archetype. Is is that's the right term to describe it by? Sure. Um, so it is. You know, we might consider shamans to be like some kind of outdated, weird thing, but it's alive and well in our internet meme culture. Oh, that's a really funny point, and and I mean, I, yeah, good, good meme, definitely. And it, well, what this brought to mind exactly was was uh, what we were talking about just just before the uh, record button. There was the the, the idea of uh, ideas competing with each other, and and I think the corollary idea to that is that you can let your thoughts die, mm. you can let your thoughts do the dying, as in you you can run through the potential futures yourself, yeah. and. Maybe you get to a potential future where, in the end, the result isn't so good, and then discard it. Right? Mm -hmm. This is the prefrontal cortex. It's 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 a base element of humanity, and and I, I think this is just taking it to the next level. Right? That that by being the person that lives the potential future of the society, there's a burden on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the difficulty level increases. And this mm -hmm. isn't to say there's necessarily a responsibility, like S Steve Jobs being the example, right? Steve Jobs probably didn't have any idea how revolutionary sure. all his products were, right? But but he ha he was a visionary, definitely. Yeah. And and so having that vision is, I think, the the important thing here. Having the vision to to see into the future, and see that, okay, this might actually work. Yeah. Well, the and then seeing, the courage to go along with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. The seeing into the future is an action toward creating that very future, right? Like Steve Jobs and his enthusiasm about his products and, you know, the impact they would have and his ability to sell it, right? To, to speak about it persuasively. That helped usher in the actual reality we now inhabit where I think Apple's still the most valuable company in the world. Maybe um, it's NVIDIA now. Yeah, well, it was up there. It went from okay. the verge of bankruptcy, right? Steve, this is why his story is so amazing, by the way. It's so archetypically heroic. The guy founds the company, gets ousted by outside money that he brings in. They drive the company into the ground. It's near bankruptcy. They bring him back in. <laughs> he boots all of them out, cuts down the product line, and brings Apple back to make it the most valuable company on the planet for some period of time. I don't know if that's today still true. Um, but can you think of a more her hero's journey than that from an entrepreneurship standpoint? I don't think there is. I think he is the paradigm of entrepreneur entrepreneurial heroicism, if we could say that, um, sure. in the context well, of all this. Well, and I can, I can think of one more very specific example and and that's of micro strategy right oh yeah that going through the dot com bubble coming out the other side and yeah. coming to a point where well hey maybe the strategy needs some changing and then I, I think he said um i don't know if this is still accurate either you have to fact check me but he had lost more money in less time than any public executive in history like yeah in, in the dot com bubble yeah, yeah. And then look where we are now. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Michael Saylor. Yeah. Yes. So so we can, I think we can have Steve Jobs as, as one example, but Michael Saylor is definitely a. a definitely. 
And people love a comeback story, right? This is built into our DNA. It's, it's every good movie you've ever watched, right? The hero gets pushed. They probably get defeated a few times. And then somehow they come back and it's all good at the end. And it's better in a way that you, you couldn't have conceived of prior to the challenges. And they choose to keep going. Yeah. That's the point. The movies that don't get made are everyone who gives up. Yeah. I, well, there are movies actually made of, of the aftermath of that. Those tend to not be pretty, but the, the heroic movies are, are uh, yeah, they don't give up. Yes. Yeah. Choose to keep so, going. So this, these individuals, I, I, I guess we're using shaman and revolutionary hero synonymously here. Well, Dr. Peterson did. Actually, th this was the, this was one point that I, I was surprised when I got to this this chapter again in my reread was that was that he, he goes into the the shaman immediately and then talks about it for a good 20 pages, something like that, and and, mm -hmm. and uses it as the prime example. And and I didn't expect that if, if I if I'm honest, that that it, this was such a core uh core thing. The the example is is a specific cultural one, basically. And and uh pulling this out from different cultural spheres. I, I actually like the the modern examples that that you you pulled out of it. But yeah, he uses them not interchangeably exactly, but this is like the primary example. So I think the implication is something like that the the modern shaman figure that that existed is is something unique. I think that's what he's getting at anyway. Gotcha. Um if I was in my own understanding of this, um I will speak about the shaman and revolutionary hero synonymously, as I understand these agents of adaptation, let's say that operate at the edges of culture. These are people that have a range of personal experience that exceeds the present adaptive capacity of their cultural milieu, as you said. All right, and maybe they've adapted to something that's useless, Right, in which case it would just be the fool, whatever. This guy figured out something no one cares about or will not be relevant in 20 years. Or maybe they figured out something that's really important that we don't know yet. And in fact, you can't really know in advance because you don't know what is going to you don't know what's going to be relevant or useful in the years ahead. Right. So this this ongoing discovery process at the edges of culture, it is the means by which the culture informs and adapts itself to changes in reality, right? Those individual touch points of the individual going into the unknown and bringing back lessons, right? Whether the lessons are useless or useful, that process is what keeps culture alive. You know, I, since we're, since we're really on this, I mean, I, I think, I think we might as well skip forward a little bit and, and we can come back to some of the, these, these things in the middle here, but the, mm -hmm. The concept of the savior is is so central here, and and there's a couple of great ex excerpts that that uh, sort of need um, some context, uh, but before uh, really getting the the complete picture. But the there there's one. I'm I'm jumping ahead. I think we're four pages off, so this would be three o two for you. I think. Okay. Um, but the um, or three o one. Um, the example given is another one from, from Norse mythology. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, but the, the idea is the, the world tree in the middle of heaven and hell, essentially. So you have, you have this concept of the world where you have a plane where humanity lives as the middle. Uh -huh. Then you have this tree or pillar or axis mundi that goes up and down. And above that is this upper world, heaven. Uh -huh. And below that is hell. But symbolically, hell is this chaotic unknown. Everyone has to go down into the, to the hell part. But being attached to heaven is this attachment to the ideal, uh -huh. Uh -huh. essentially. And what it's getting at, basically, is that the savior is the one who hangs on the world tree it's it, the, the cross mm, is mm, the same example mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in in 12 rules for life dr peterson goes into this in his his introduction uh, he, he had a dream about about 
uh, a cross of a, a cathedral and and basically putting himself specifically there. And so the the quote that he references at at this point, I, I've got a different translation of it, but it's it's another one from this from this Norse um, mythology. The quote goes, "I know that I hung on a wind battered tree nine long nights." pierced by a spear and given to Odin, myself to myself, on mm. that tree, whose roots grow in a place that no one has ever seen. Mm. No one gave me food. No one gave me drink. At the end, I peered down. I took the runes. Screaming, I took them. And then, I fell. Mm. My imagination expanded. I became wise. I grew and I thrived. One word chased another word flowing from my mouth. One deed chased another deed flowing from my hands. I wow. love that quote. So from, um, yeah, it's another one from this uh, Abamal. Um, so so the only a partial excerpt of that is from the, the um, what Dr. Peterson included. But yeah, that's, that's the whole thing, basically. And it's the Ooh. savior figure. Hanging on the world tree. Thoughts? Um, yeah, first of all, just to reiterate, heaven and hell, which I think, I don't know, I grew up in the South. It sounded like when I was growing up, people actually believed in some type of fairy tale about there being this mystical beyond heaven or this mystical beyond hell and you know you're going to end up in one of these two places after you die but when i when you get into the mythology it's not it doesn't really ever describe it that way you know even what you just described like it's not that it's more like heaven is the domain of the ideal right where we can rationally determine what would be best like some something to aim at right this would be the ideal circumstances or way of harmoniously arranging ourselves, whatever it may be, whatever the ideal we're striving towards. And then hell is more like the, well, it's the chaos or the unknown of the real, right? Real. Like if you're just, if you're, and again, if we remove all the capital and goods from around you, right, you strip you naked and drop you in the middle of a jungle in the middle of the night in Africa somewhere. Well, that's what reality is, right? That's how we started. We're basically naked in the jungle alone. Like, what do we do from there? So what do we do? Well, through this process of, as you said, the the, the savior hangs onto the world tree, I think, is it, was that the language? Yeah, yeah, that's the language Peterson uses anyway. Yeah. So the, the, the savior that hangs on this world tree, right? The, the branches of which are reaching up towards heaven, the ideal, but whose roots are penetrating down into hell they are renovating the real world the chaos of the real world to be more like their ideals right we're, we're we are reforming the physical world in the shape of our ideals this is and this gets back into that idea of the walled garden the paradise right that we're pushing back the edges of the unknown and the chaos, but you can't get rid of it because we still need to be informed by it, right? It's where all the novelty exists. You can't, you can't have totalitarianism where you just say, oh, this is a centrally planned place. There's no chaos at all. It's this balance between order and chaos. And this, this savior is the one that is engaging in the useful actions that make the real more ideal. Right, we're making the real world conform more closely to the world we would like, the world we have formulated in our imaginations as ideal, right? Our collective imagination, which is another description or definition even of mythology, right? It is a product of the collective imagination. Yes, exactly. And and the the collective yeah, the collective imagination that explained these things in in such a such a way it's not clear right these stories aren't clear on their face but if you decode the language and you understand what they're actually getting at mm -hmm. well then it then it starts to make sense and no. so so 
I, I want to explain the the quote in more detail, but we we passed over the paradise part, and that that was specifically the the bit that I that I I wanted to uh, just put a little more emphasis on. And the the paradise part is is it's it's the conception of the the walled garden, as you said, but it's it's really the the world before the world existed. Mm. Um, there's a quote here, and that's what I was just trying to. Um, just trying to grab um it, the, the there's so many ways of talking about it the okay the the idea of paradise encompasses somewhat more than the the previous places of stability it's it's all previous places of stability uh every previous place of stability becomes in this manner order as such and balanced perfectly with potential or mm. um here, there's a better one. There's definitely a better one. And potential uh, is synonymous with disorder, right? Again, that's that. Mm. That is the wall in the walled garden. It's the it's the delineation between the order and the chaos. But you need some balance between them. It can't just yeah. be one or the other. E- exactly. And and well, so the, so the entire point here is really that the the paradise isn't a real thing. The paradise is yes. this is not this, static. Uh, well, here, so 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 uh, I, I found it. There is no suffering in the Garden of Eden. In such a state, however, things do not really exist. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the quote. Mm. With without, there's more, of course, but but without uh, without the capability for suffering, without the capability for disorder, this is a place that does not exist. Right. This is an ideal that is unachievable. Mm. But it's the thing that we place at the top. Mm. Paradise and heaven aren't equivalent, but they're related, yeah. right? The the paradise is this state of being before realizing there's all this other stuff outside yeah. of it, all this other craziness, all the things that can kill us. Uh, and another point in here is is that humanity has has necessarily been conditioned with death as the consequence of any form of unknown, essentially. Yeah. That. Anything that isn't within the realm of the known could kill you mm-hmm. because we're vulnerable. We, we can really easily, our, our meat suits can, can stop functioning really easily. And, and then death becomes this ingrained part of the culture. And so paradise is this state where ignorance reigns, mm. where you have no idea about what goes on outside. But when the serpent comes in and gives you the knowledge of everything that can go wrong, mm. then it all falls away. Paradise mm. lost. You don't, you don't ever get it back. Mm-hmm. You don't ever get it back as, a, as an individual, as a, as a self-actualized individual. You don't ever get it back. That's the point. This is reminding me of, I think this is my favorite Peterson lecture in his Psychological Significance of the Bible series. I think it's lecture number 22, which is my favorite number, of course, but it's on Adam and Eve, the emergence of Adam and Eve, maybe, I think is what the title is. And Mm. he describes the fall of man being an allegory for the discovery of time, actually, that we are the animal that is metacognitively aware of our own mortality and the mortality of everyone that will, our children and everyone that will ever come after us. So we understand that we have to work always, even when things are good, right? And accumulate goods as a buffer against an always uncertain future. And so that fault, like you said, the snake coming into the garden, it's like, oh, well, everything's perfect and fine. We can just sit around and eat the fruit and, you know, we're not, we're unconcerned with the future, basically. But once we discover that the snake has come into the garden and can hurt us or hurt our children, then we start to assign that label, right? Again, that is the snake. Okay, well, where is the snake of the snakes, right? The snake of the snakes would be where all the snakes live. Well, what is the snake's nest? What are, you know, what are the other threats? The fire, the predatory cats, whatever the things are that harm us, we start to metacognitively work our way through these threats. And that is what makes us so much different, right? We've discovered time. We have the ability to label and transmit knowledge to our offspring about these threats in a way that we keep pushing back the threats. We keep pushing back the wall of the garden. And that is where we are today, right? We're in civilization. Most of us are born in a hospital. 
you've got electric lights, you've got food, you've got a refrigerator, you've got an army, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of automobiles, like all these miraculous innovations we've developed as a result of that process. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, it's almost like suffering is the tension between the ideal and the real, but we are the only animal capable of formulating the ideal, right? Other animals don't do that. They just live in the real, right? It's like, uh, you know, a lion does not think about how to improve the kingdom of, well, so far as I know, they don't sit around and like philosophize about how they could be better. You know, maybe they could like, you know, increase their productivity or something like that. They just sort of, they don't think about reality. They just operate based on instinct and impression. But humans use conception, right? We use cognition to think about things at a different level. And that metacognitive step involves suffering because the ideal is never real, right? So to the extent we can formulate the ideal and not create it, there is suffering, right? I would prefer to be here, but I am here. And so the role of the hero is to just help facilitate that, to alleviate that suffering for themselves and future others. Oh, that's so interesting. And, and I think it, it actually perfectly maps onto the example, that this this world tree thing, the ideal is, is up at the top, right? Mm -hmm. And the chaotic unknown is, is this thing you have to get to, but you put yourself in the middle, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's kind of the, that's always kind in of the middle, the, always in the middle. Yeah. Well, always yeah. in the middle. You'll Strive never, the you'll never get the ideal. You'll never, I mean, you will achieve the real, I guess, when you finally die. Um, but even then you get incorporated into the culture, right? If the culture, yeah. again, the last breath you draw is one death. And then the last time your name is spoken inside of that culture is your second death. So to the Love extent it. you contribute to the second, you know, the extension of your second death is the extent to which you contributed to the advancement of culture. Well, and so I, I think, I think the, the last point I want to, to get to here. First of all, the 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 last thought I had about the the snakes thing, um, I can't remember who this was. It probably was Dr. Peterson or someone related. But but the 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 meta threat being a snake probably means that in our deep deep past it was snakes mm -hmm. that was the yeah. specific threat, right? Yeah, and and that just stuck. The, the, and there's supposedly there's supposedly evidence for this that that yeah. the environments that hu humanity hom early hominids were found would have been in the same places that snakes lived and that those for would sure. have been probably the primary threat at the time right so it's just and you think about something that deep yeah what can kill you faster and with more surprise than a snake right it's just literally you're fishing around in the grass looking for some mushrooms or whatever and then ow snake dead. <laughs> Yes, and 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 so that has turned into this this symbol of the the meta snake, the the yeah. serpent, the dragon, something like that. Yes, and, and well, so so the the point of the the oh paradigm. sorry, if if I can sorry before you go on, you just hit yes. on something great that also getting from Peterson, which he's re relating from a book that I actually don't know, but he's saying that the dragon, the mythological dragon, is an amalgam of all the primary threat vectors that humans faced in an ancestral world, right? It is predatory cats, predatory birds, snakes, and fire. If you put all those things together, what do you get? You get a fucking dragon, right? That's why the dragon is, is the primary threat. And it's also the guardian of the treasure, right? He is, when you penetrate the unknown and you slay the dragon, you learn something about the unknown, you get the treasure, which is the knowledge, right? You get the gold. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there because you, you brought up the dragon, which is a great point. No, it's no, it's great. Uh, love that point. Love that point. And well, so so I mean, the, there's there's so much here that we we could go back to examples and examples and examples. But uh, but I think I, I'd I'd rather go back to this this savior concept uh, because taking this taking this thing all the way to the end, I think, is going to be the the most impactful way to to show what this chapter is actually about mm -hmm. so i want to explain that the the quote that i that i gave earlier and and this idea of the the sort of the norse savior this this is this that is specifically the language that that dr mm -hmm. peterson used here is that 
Odin is this this Norse savior figure. I, I don't dispute that. It, that's a good way to encapsulate the idea. But the the Odin figure is is one that has fascinated me for years. The podcast I did before I got into Bitcoin was primarily a Norse mythology podcast for the first mm. for the first little while there, and I was trying to do what Doctor Peterson did with the the biblical stories with Norse mythology basically. Mm. And yeah, I I mean, yeah, niche thing, pretty nerdy, whatever, but I I learned a, a ton there and and so the 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 little nugget that I can pull out of that is what this character really is and it's it's related to this shaman concept as well. And so the the quote that I was giving where I know that I hung on a wind-battered tree nine long nights pierced by a spear and given to Odin myself to myself. Okay. This is saying that that Odin sacrificed himself to himself. It's it's just saying it in a slightly funny way, maybe. But the point here is that Odin decides to get up on this world tree and go through some period of suffering. Nine nights pierced by a spear, something like that. There is speculation that that's a that's a Christian addition, uh, a reference to uh, Jesus being pierced by a spear on the cross. Mm-hmm. Okay, th- that's that's reasonable here. But the spear symbology is is in other places. the The spear was the weapon of Odin. Essentially, he threw a spear over the battlefield, and whoever it flew over uh, would would be the the warriors that he would choose to go to his hall. Something like mm. that. Something. Yeah, hmm. nice and poetic. Hmm. But the the point is this period of sacrifice at the end, he peered down, I peered down, and I took the runes, and then I fell. Okay. So the runes are the writing system of hmm. the old Norse. Literally, they are they are letters, and they, they're based on the same Phoenician alphabet that eventually the Greek and the Latin alphabet came from this is proven they they look a little similar to if, you, if you've ever if you've ever seen uh is sort of this um triangle shape with a with a uh line across that's like their symbol for t so mm-hmm. it's very mm-hmm. similar very similar to 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 what this uh uh in english would look like but they're they're literally letters and there is all this magical properties and and uh there, there's a whole section of this this poem afterwards that goes into the the meaning of these these runes and that's that's not important he was literally discovering written language is what this story is saying that's that's what this is saying hmm. and the thing about this is why such an ordeal to go through this to to have to go through a period of sacrifice of self sacrifice in order to achieve something so meaningful that literally written language is is based on that at least according to this culture right right and 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 so this is just a a self-sacrificial figure by by an entirely different uh, method it's it's not Mm. the same as the christ story but it's achieving results that are bringing back something very specific to to the culture and that i i love the last point that that he he falls you fall Mm -hmm. it's like you kind of have to let go Mm-hmm. At the very end, you got to let go and finally let the the new thing out into the world. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, what comes after that is imagination, wisdom, thriving, everything making sense. I relate to that a ton because the the thing about this specific way this works is that the hard period eventually ends. The difficulty eventually ends and you you get over some kind of hill, some kind of hump. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you've mastered the skill or you've brought the knowledge back and everything makes sense. And then it seems like everything is smooth. Everything is just flowing. Mm. And I just love it. I, I, I love this, uh, this figure and the, the example of what it is. Do the work. Self sacrifice, mm-hmm. sacrifice yourself to yourself, and do the work. And what might the rewards be? Well, anything you can imagine. Mm. And then eventually, it might be difficult, but it'll get easier, and you'll thrive. That's the that's what that quote meant. 
yeah, it's very inspirational. Um, and I guess what stands out for me there is, you know, the, the great personal sacrifice for what, what is he doing? What is he doing? He's trying to discover meaning or maybe even the instruments of meaning, right? The instruments by which we convey meaning, the runes, the letters, the words. Again, that's what you're doing. Like we need, before we could discover lessons and codify them in written language, well, presumably we had to go out into the world and figure out how written language works, right? We had to, I don't know how we did that. We went into the unknown and somehow figured out, hey, it's going to be a lot more productive if we can stop. There's an old African proverb that every time a man dies, a library burns to the ground. So if we figure out written language, well, all of a sudden, we can stop letting these libraries burn to the ground with the death of every man, right? We can start compiling this into actual libraries and transmitting the knowledge more effectively across time and across minds of, of future people. Um, and yeah, just the great sacrifice that went into that, you know? So it's like, we obviously we talked about the touch point earlier, the, you individually go out and touch the unknown and bring back the lessons. Like, what about the guys that had to figure out that process in the first place? Right. They didn't even have that process to inform them. Like, how did they, it's, this is where it gets really mind blowing. It's like when you trace that whole process back to its origin, it's like, who were the first, who actually, who were the first, I mean, this is the Adam and Eve thing, right? Like what was, where was the fall of man actually? into this domain of the ideal intention with the real. It's fascinating to think about. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, and even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. And I, this is such, like this, all this content, in my mind, I feel like I keep coming back to the same point. It's like, we're sort of, I guess that's what mythology is doing, right? It's like showing you the process by which you have these insights but hopefully we're seeing this in enough because this is what peterson's work did for me originally it was like it said the same thing in enough different ways that it eventually started to stick like you know he first said oh we all live in stories i was like that sounds like complete bullshit but then as he said that enough different ways and explained it more in depth it started to, to stick so i feel like maybe that's what we're doing to some extent here is like almost repeating a core theme or core themes in many different ways. I agree with that. And I'm, I'm conscious that maybe this is repetitive to just someone listening and this is brand new, but uh, I mean, the, it sort of is the point, right? That this stuff is worth repeating and learning about. And yeah. the, the point is the lesson too, because, because it's, it's not necessarily to say everyone needs to read this 500 page book. Right. But maybe if you pull something out of it, then, then that book did its job. Right. And we're yeah. doing our job. You know? Exactly. Yeah, clearly, yeah, clearly these lessons bear repeating, uh, hence why they're the most repeated stories in the world, right? That's what mythology is. Okay. All right. So I'll read an excerpt on page, this is my PDF, page 281. I think this is your 277. Uh, Peterson writes, history is an invaluable storehouse of the creative experience and wisdom of the past. Past wisdom is not always sufficient to render present potentiality habitable. If the structure of experience itself was static and finite, like the past, all things would have been conquered long ago and the lives of the ancestors and their children would differ little in kind. But the structure of experience is dynamic and infinite in possibility. The nature of experience itself varies with time. 
New challenges and dangers appear out of the future into the present where none existed before. And so I was, I was relating the, this to you offline. I'm writing this piece right now that focuses a lot on the nature of metaphor. Um, and I think the primary or a primary determinant of what makes our experience and the like say our us modern people different from the experiences of our ancestors is technology largely right like the fact that well we're on a zoom call right now and if you rewound the clock 10,000 years we're our ancestors are probably in a field throwing a spear somewhere right like the technology was totally different so the technology really shapes what you do day to day moment to moment and so in this writing, it talks about, and a lot of this is inspired by the book, another book, sorry to throw so many books at you guys, Metaphors We Live By, which is a really interesting book, describes how all of our words and our phrases are metaphorical in nature. And so that as we change the way we engage with physical reality, we actually develop new metaphors for understanding that reality. One of the examples, um, and this is like, it's in every, it's in everyday speak. I'm using it right there. There's a container metaphor. This idea is inside everyday speak. Like, obviously that's, there's no container called everyday speak that this thing is inside. We just say that it's a metaphor. Um, and so again, if technology is what largely or primarily determines the difference in our experience between moderns and our ancestors and technologies also give us new metaphors, then this is, I think this is like, I'm, I'm, we're get, maybe touching this same idea from another perspective. Um, I think Joseph Campbell has called mythology as like the collection of cultures metaphors right it's all the metaphors packed into one storehouse whereas peterson's writing here history is an invaluable storehouse of all the creative experience and wisdom of the past but it's technology that changes that relationship so it changes the way we interact with reality which then changes the way we speak about and conceive of reality which then changes the things we invent right as we conceive of things differently we invent new tools and so this is like this ongoing co-evolutionary process or this creative tension between the tool maker and the tool, right? We make a new tool, we get new metaphors for describing how we interact with the world, and then we get new thoughts about how to make even new tool, newer tools, and so on and so forth. So anyways, I've just been writing about that and wanted to introduce that as another angle to talk about this today. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's a great angle. And, and well, the, the point here, I guess, is that the the advancements are the role of the savior. The the savior is the one that does this. And I, I mean, again, we're in blasphemy territory, basically, because you know, savior and Christ and all this. But hey, like, yeah, you know, this is this is the example. And 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 actually, I think it gives a lot of uh, an, another layer to the the story of Christ. Well, right. If, yeah. I, again, I hear you on the blasphemy thing, but it's the opposite in my mind. Mm. It's like we're saying, no, Christ is the archetypal savior, right? This the savior towards which all in any, anything that is attempting to be a savior would want to. And you need to enact that approach to existence to be a good savior. It's like the meta. It's the he, it's the meta hero. The meta hero. Christ yes. is the meta hero. Exactly, but but every culture seems to have one, right? And that's that's sort of yeah. the part that gets yeah. that gets a little tricky, right? Is that is that yeah. there there are there are these other examples that appear to be equally valid. Now, I know Dr. Peterson has taken this in the in the direction of that that the end result, at least for Western civilization, is the Christ figure. But he he interestingly also he he acknowledges in in this chapter that the Eastern uh, equivalent is the Buddha. Yes. And, and yes. and this is this is definitely true. The, the the stories have loads of parallels to the to the extent where the more conspiratorially minded might think that there is actually a common origin. But I, I think if you read this stuff, it's 
But there's definitely point. not, I'm pretty sure, historically, right? They definitively yeah. have separate origins. There's there's some thoughts about that the parallels might be a, like a like a little bit much, and same thing with the Egyptian uh, horse. But I think you just read this stuff basically, and yeah, and, and you get that it's the substrate thing, yeah. uh, essentially. But the 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 point is that the the Buddha is is basically the the pinnacle of the of the Eastern philosophy, at least at least to to Doctor Peterson, and then Christ is similarly the the mm -hmm. equivalent for Western philosophy. And when I was looking for Odin, it was the equivalent in Northern philosophy, just for uh, mm -hmm. a simple shorthand for that. Uh, I was looking for validity in 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 other places, right? That that other ways of conceptualizing the world, because, because again, I was having difficulty with my with my own uh, Christian upbringing and, and and all this. But the 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 ultimate point here is that when you get behind the the details, right? When you can actually see behind the curtain, to use another right. metaphor. It, it all has this framework underneath it and yeah. it, it all refers back to this to this gigantic archetypal engine yes right so so yeah. so it 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 all comes back to that that's the point oh, i love the archetypal engine great metaphor by the way <laughs> um and it's yeah so when you start to look and this is why etymology i think is so useful you start to look through the words and you see the same conceptual territory, they're all mapping from different perspectives. You see sort of the same thing with these wisdom traditions, right? You look through, well, there's the story of the Buddha, there's there's the story of Muhammad in, in the Islamic tradition, there's the story of Christ and Christianity, there's many others. There are a lot of parallels, right? It's not to say, and I think where the danger of all of this is the dogmatism, ultimately. It's where you get so entrenched and you say no this idea is this is the only story that can convey this conceptual territory this is the only map that can convey the meaning of this territory that's why i think it's dangerous right it's like no there you can map you can map a territory an infinite number of ways you can walk across a field infinite number of ways <laughs> right there there what did the old Taoists say there's many paths to the top of a mountain and so this, these stories are just, I think, representations of the many different paths to the top of the same uh, archetypal engine, as you put it. Well, and I love it because the the thing there is the, the implication is that if you go down one path, you can get an understanding of what it means to have lived in that culture. Mm -hmm. When we talked about this, this this sort of substrate thing last time, where there's this programming that we we have we have this underpinning that's mm -hmm. we have this underpinning this judeo-christian because we're, we're from this this western uh, mm -hmm. western upbringing right north american or mm -hmm. or european mostly has that right but underneath that there's there's there are other things there are other angles to to approach this from and i think this this comes down to a little bit of empathy and and understanding the way other people see things if you learn their stories mm -hmm. you can understand them better yes. that's at least the way i've approached it and why why i wanted to explore something some things that initially to me appeared to be quite different but then the the thing about it is that the, these stories at the end they all say the same thing there's always some kind of creation there's always come some kind of hero story there there are variations on the details mm -hmm. and maybe there are different parables and different bits of wisdom but they all get to the same thing and and mm -hmm. almost universally again there's some kind of destruction and disillusion mm -hmm. and ultimate ending to the to the mythology mm. but then some kind of rebirth and it's 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 fascinating and yeah. it's it's like it's like we do have this psychologically within us and, and yeah. it came from deep in the past and Pulling this out is is if more people pulled this stuff out and tried to understand it, I think there would be a, a lot more empathy, understanding, and striving for excellence. Amen. And if I'm striving to use a metaphor that is in accordance with the cultural and technological milieu that I grew up in, which is I'm an old millennial, so I'm, you know, very familiar with digital technology, but I also remember a time before digital technology. 
I would describe culture as like the hardware, individual individuals are the software, right? Updating the, the culture over time through experimentation. And truth, or at least our best approximation of truth is the content of all of this, right? That whole thing is mythology, right? You've got the the embodied actions like like we again we don't we do this unconsciously right we with private property rights I would again point people to that book inventing the individual that argued before Christ and I, I'm not saying Christ is necessary to invent private property rights everywhere maybe Buddha was sufficient in other cultures I don't know but before that conception of Christ we didn't really have private property rights so the fact that we all just take that for granted today like it's latent cultural programming it's beneath the surface it's in the hardware of who we are, but it wasn't right. It was a time where it was in the software that someone individually had to go out and experiment and create this idea of the individual having some type of sovereignty that's superordinate to the collective, to the state. And the whole point of this dynamic process between cultural hardware and individual software is to get a better approximation of truth, right? We're trying to get, we're trying to map as much truth about ourselves to ourselves as we can over time. And maybe that's why all of these different wisdom traditions triangulate onto the same conceptual territory. It's like, oh, we are individuals. We do, the the horizon of the future is infinitely unpredictable. We need everyone's eyes, ears, talents, know-how. We don't even know what skills we're going to need in the future. So we need freedom and we need to... I don't know, harmonize ourselves in a way that's nonviolent because that makes us more productive and that helps us deal with the future better, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess in a nutshell, like you can't, these things are co-evolved, right? You can't have an individual without culture and you can't have a culture without individuals. And that's what this whole thing is describing the process of, I think. Yeah, actually, uh, I won't be able to grab the exact page or, or quote here, but early on in this in this um uh, in this section that was something like the shaman is the the revolutionary hero is the best um is the best servant of the state and i know it's it's not in the way bitcoiners think about that yeah but it's it it, it yeah you could say uh, culture culture yeah for sure. yes that's way better because yeah. the revolutionary hero is yeah yeah someone someone needs to to have a chat with dr peterson <laughs> culture, something like that. yeah no but 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 it, it it's true though it's true though the the individuals that that make these advances are the ones that bring all of humanity forward and the savior metaphor or the savior title it's perfect you're saving the rest of society from the terrible, terrible mm. tragedy of not having that advancement of ignorance, of ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Right. That's what the Savior, mm. literally, what the Savior spoke to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As uh, they killed Christ, right? They we killed our own Savior. Which we this is that story is about the dangers. Right. We're treated the Savior as if he were a fool. And now I, I obviously can't no. pretend to say like I'm capturing the whole story of Christ in one thing, but like that's one aspect of it, right? It's like people were so in their own ignorance, they killed their savior, treated yes. him as if he were a fool. But obviously in retrospect, there were a lot of lessons in his life that we continue to draw wisdom from. Well, and I think one of the points is he still did it anyway. He yes. still did it anyway, and he, and he still redeemed civilization. Yes. He still did the thing, he, and he, and he yes. did it intentionally. And when is the last time his name will ever be spoken? Probably at the end of humanity. Probably not until the very end. Probably be the last name spoken, actually. Very, very What do people say when the meteor hits the earth? Like, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Oh, hilarious, man. So I don't mean mean to be flippant about it, but I think it's very serious, man. It's like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where you were going with this, but uh, I have a way that I can take a few of the threads we were talking about, not to turn this into Norse mythology hour with Luke, but I, I, I have no, another. I think it's very fascinating. Cool. Well, I have another thing that can base, basically take us to s- sort of the conclusion points of this, this chapter, if that works for you. That sounds great. All right. So I wanna, I, I'll revisit 
Odin briefly, just to to give a little bit of uh, understanding of the character, because there are some things that are pretty cool from an archetypal side. At least I, I find them cool. Uh, he's a he's a searcher of knowledge. Uh, he's he's on a quest for knowledge constantly. There's there's uh, a, a creation and destruction of the world uh, in in Norse mythology is is all from this this one poem called the Veluspa, or the the uh the words of the the seer the vulva uh mm-hmm. the, this um woman who who can see the future and odin is going down on a trip to the underworld to try and find the knowledge from this woman who can see the future who lives in the underworld i hope you're already going a little bit like sparkly <laughs> with the, yeah how this is working here um it's a shamanistic journey basically but he wants to know the future and so she starts by telling him the past. And, and so this is this interesting framing story of how the, the creation story of Norse mythology gets gets told in, the, in this way. It's, it's interesting. So it, and it, at the end, it switches to what's going to happen in the future. Mm-hmm. But constantly, this woman who can see the future, she keeps on saying, do you want to know more or what? Mm. Should I keep going? Hmm. Always. A, oh, and he doesn't need to answer. She, she just always keeps going. He, he always wants to know more. And and so first of all, this is just putting the character up. This is someone who always wants to know more, no matter how painful or difficult mm. that might be. And I think what we've already talked about with the seeing the future thing, if you're not taking that literally, you're just saying that if you can understand the past and the present well enough, well, you can see what is most likely to happen, something like that. I, mm. I, I think that's what that entire story is is, is saying, basically. But the the other couple of of features here one is that odin is known for only having one eye mm. the thing is in this cosmology this is actually still explained here in, in in maps of meaning is that uh through throughout this world tree setup there are nine worlds in the the norse cosmology and it's not important to go into all nine of them but there's one that's the heaven that's the the realm of the gods one that's the realm of the people and one that's the underworld and then mm-hmm. six more just for fun but there's a well that cycles through all of them and, and it and it's mm. it really more like a spring of water and what dr peterson describes this as and i agree with him is is that this is the the flow of positive chaos basically the the mm. potential of positive chaos symbolized by water flowing through all mm. three of these worlds and the there are three wells basically not to overcomplicate it, where the where the water can be drawn from, this primeval mm. water can be drawn from, and Odin puts his eye into the well deep in the chaotic part of the world, mm. so he can always see, he can always see the positive potential of what's going mm. on, and I don't know what literally we could put as an analogy there, but again with the eye. And going all the way back to that Horace story from near the beginning of what mm. we were talking about, he he loses an eye, mm. and the eye is the symbol of that which pays attention, mm. right? Well, if you put that what pays attention on mm. the positive aspect of chaos, mm. he's a visionary, something like that. But but his faith is to die. Odin's faith is to die, just like everyone else. He knows this. He understands it. He's not looking for how am I going to survive dying. It's what do I need to do before I die so that I can ensure that the next generation is going to survive? That's the entire theme of mm. Norse mythology, if, if I'm putting it in one sentence. And so the you, you, you might have heard of this one, Ragnarok, Ragnarok. Mm-hmm, of course. The, the, the destruction of the, the, the gods, the, the doom mm. of the gods. Well, okay. So Odin is killed by the wolf Fenrir. We're actually going to get into this in, in chapter five a little bit. The the symbol of a wolf devouring the the king. It's mm-hmm. another archetype, archetypal story. And the world serpent kills Odin's son Thor, who is the mightiest, the strongest, the most capable of of um battling against such chaotic mm-hmm. things. Something like that. So th- these are the figures at play but i want to read out the end of this ragnarok cycle basically so the sun turns black 
the earth sinks into the sea. The bright stars fall out of the sky. Flames scorch the leaves of Yggdrasil, the leaves of the world tree. A great bonfire reaches to the highest clouds. I see the earth rise a second time from out of the sea. Mm. Green once more. Waterfalls flow and eagles fly overhead, hunting for fish among the mountain peaks. Fields will bear harvest without labor. All sickness will disappear. Mm. Balder will come back. Hoth and Balder will live in Odin's hall, as well as other gods. Have you learned enough yet, Odin? Then, the dark dragon will come flying down from the dark mountains, that glistening serpent. He'll bear corpses in his wings as he flies over the valley. Mm. Now I must retire. That's the end of the story. Wow. Fuck, that's so interesting. I've never heard this before. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm just going to throw stuff out there. I've Obviously, for someone hearing about this, but this, you were talking about water is the flow of positive chaos. Another way of saying positive chaos is potentiality, right? Or potential. Um, it's not, we, we often refer to chaos as like, oh, it's the unknown. It's chaos. It's like we're, when you fall into chaos, it's bad. But it's not, there's not a pure negative moral charge to it, right? There's, it's also the place where all discovery comes from, all novelty, all innovation, all new ideas. Literally, it's in the dark, it's in the unknown, and someone, the Savior, brings it to light. So this idea of a flow of potential, which I think you said between the three wells, uh, I yeah, forgot so, what the yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it, the specifics of it are not exactly important, but yeah, it's 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 between the the worlds. So a number of like again, manifestations of this principle come to mind, like the circulatory system in the body, right? We we need the constant movement to, you know, just to clear waste out of the cells and to bring new nutrients and oxygen to the cells and take away the old stuff, right, and into the gut to excrete. It's this constant idea of, um facilitating the economy of your biology, right? It needs to be, your cells need to be constantly taking out the trash and bringing in the groceries, you know? Like it's that kind of idea. And this circulation of potential is what does that, that we call blood. In an economic lens, this is money, right? Money is liquidity. Money is economic potentiality, right? Money is, can literally be anything the market can create. And then you were talking about Odin putting his eye into the the water i think yeah or the well to the well, see, to yeah. see what's going on well what is i mean the like again this is where i talk about money a lot on the show being an instrument of perception right it's the price is one of the primary instruments for commanding attention in the world so if you can see when you see the world through the eye of money you see a lot there's a lot of data compression taking place so if you're odin and you want to you know, be the king and know what's going on in the kingdom, then it's probably really important that you look at your kingdom through the lens of its circulating lifeblood, which again could be money in a metaphorical sense, or could be the actual lifeblood, the cultural interactions of people, you know, memes, whatever the thing may be. And so, and then you, at the very end, you were talking about Ragnarok. I'm reminded of Peterson's point that every culture is built on the dead body of the old king. Right. And, and the key, we could consider this as like the principle that united the kingdom, right? There was some principle that worked. And then the son, you know, the son of the king, hopefully, if he's useful, he goes out and discovers something new. And then he incorporates that lesson with his dead father's body, right? This, this We talked about this in the Egyptian mythology earlier. You reincorporate that new lesson with the old ways, and that becomes the new old ways. If, if, I can say it like that. And so constantly revivifying and updating the principle that unites the kingdom, which is what the king represents. And king, and this word, you know, um, king, kingdom, kinship, right? It's all about this interconnection and, and integrity of, of, of people, basically. So, yeah, I've never heard that before. It's really interesting. But those are the things that came to mind as you were saying that. Definitely. And, and well, and, and so, I mean, I, I think the, the excerpt that I, 
I said at the end is is actually more like the the way of tying this back into the the serpent is always still there at the end. But the yeah. the you know the, the the parts from the parts from before the, yeah the, the, it's it's all it's all elements that we've seen other places and that show that there is some understanding of what this stuff means right yeah. what it means and and uh not to get into the figures too specific way too specifically but there, there's a different savior figure in 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 the norse mythology that named balder and, and he's the the aspect of all that is good and shining in the world but but he dies and he, and he dies unfairly but he comes back at the at the end uh, mm. after after his father dies and and there's just an optimism and and there's a uh, an idea that uh, an understanding that yes we're all going to die but at the end at the end the next generation the the best of the next generation the hope is that that lives on yeah and well that's the meaning of the suffering right the meaning of the suffering the legacy that is the meaning of the suffering over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, but it wasn't until I started working with a biohacker, Anthony D. Clementi, last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. I'll just read one other excerpt here because it's so, I like how Peterson, I really like, one of the, my favorite things about this book is that he goes on these mythological tangents in depth, but then he also will, he puts it in such psychologically scientific descriptive language so you kind of get it both ways, right? Because if you hear these stories, you might be like, oh, what is this? adult fairy tales next? But then it's yeah. like, then you hear the other side of it, like the very engrossing scientific, you know, highly nuanced description of it. And you're like, oh, wait, maybe there's more to this than I, again, maybe I wrote this off as a fool and there might be something, some element of the savior in this, in these stories. One of the excerpts I like about uh, from Peterson on this topic, he says, those, I'm on my page 282, which is your whatever, I give up at this point. <laughs> uh, those who bear the initial burden for the forward movement of history are capable of transforming personal idiosyncrasy and revelation into collective reality without breaking down under the weight of isolation and fear. Such creativity is feared and hated and desired and worshipped by every human individual and by every human society in general. Creative individuals destroy old values and threaten with chaos, but they also bear light and the promise of better things. It is in this manner that the sacrifice of the revolutionary savior redeems and rekindles the cosmos. A revolutionary hero is the individual who decides voluntarily, courageously to face some aspect of the unknown and threatening. He may also be the only person who is presently capable of perceiving that social adaptation is inc incompletely or improperly structured in a particular way. Only he understands that there still remain unconquered evil spirits, dangerous unknowns, and threatening possibilities. In taking creative action, he re encounters chaos generates new myth predicated behavioral strategies and extends the boundaries or transforms the paradigmatic structure 
of cultural competence. So it's just another way, more descriptive way, perhaps, of saying, of describing the value of all these stories. No, that's a wonderful quote. And and I mean, I really agree with your point about that the the value of maps of meaning and what Dr. Peterson has done is explaining these stuff. And he uses these examples to illustrate the points that he has made some serious insights with, right? And and it, of course, in many sections, he draws from a lot of psych, psychology literature, mythology literature. He's he is definitely uh, building on previous scholarship, of mm-hmm. course, no question. But the the uniqueness is the is the the point of. Uh, tying this all together in in a way that explains this in in a new way i'd never heard it i'd never heard it before and yeah the the example i think this entire chapter is giving an example of the hardest path uh-huh. the, the 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 hardest path that has the most reward be because i think it is essential here to to understand that it's not everyone's path to be the savior it's not everyone's mm-hmm. calling, uh, but the rewards of that are immense, not just for you, but for society, for culture. Yes. And, and so maybe this is the, the one to put at the top of the hierarchy. I think that's another point here is that maybe this story is the one to put above all other stories. The basic hero myth, as we've, we've dealt, looked into before, where go kill the dragon of chaos and, and and all that okay that that's that's the start but the savior that hangs in the place between heaven and hell and goes through the self sacrifice and makes the advancement maybe that's the one that goes beyond and is even more essential for civilization to have developed the hero mm-hmm. story might have been in in the micro what needed to be done day to day and what needs to happen when addressing any challenge, but this is the way that society, culture, civilization, and the individual advance yeah. themselves. I love that. The he- yeah, again, it's fractal, right? The hero's journey or, okay, yes, the hero's journey is what we're doing in the micro day to day, right? You're constantly facing the unknown. You're constantly trying to learn, get better, right? Just these micro movements of adaptation but okay that's great that's for you your family maybe your business whatever your sphere of influence is but there is a fractal a macrocosmic fractal reflection of that which is the savior right the hero of heroes the king of kings this is the christ archetype doesn't mean again i'm not being dogmatic saying it's only christ you know my god's better than your god it's just That's the word we're using to talk about this concept, right? This idea, whatever you want to say. And it's not, by the way, you mentioned the blasphemy territory earlier. I'm also sensitive to that. I'm not trying to detract from any supernatural theological significance Christ may have. I don't actually know enough about that to comment on it. I'm just really interpreting this through what I have learned through Peterson's work. A lot of which, I mean, at some point it just blurs into the theological, right? It's like we're okay, if this, if this pattern of action is the one that has most successfully defined the human race across time, well, what does Peterson say about a spirit? A spirit is a pattern that propagates agnostic to its substrate. So a pattern that propagates through different substrates, well, that's what this is. So it's like, um, anyway, it's, yeah, the, the hero journey at the micro requires the savior at the macro, I think, is a, is a great point you made. Yeah, you know, yeah, thanks. And no, I mean, and I agree with you about the the dogmatic and the the theologic part because I mean, I think I've said this before is that is that this book and Dr. Peterson's other work helped me get past the the dogmatic mm-hmm. and For see sure. the patterns. Yes, and and the thing is, what what I'm trying to say here to to ad nauseum, the re- repeating myself a little bit is is that. I think this stuff is somewhere to find meaning from outside of traditional religion and outside of other forms of philosophy. Mm-hmm. Because you can look at these 
building blocks of society. And take your pick. Take your pick of the story. And and also similarly, if 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 you look at this stuff and get some understanding for it, and then there's an even deeper meaning for the the religion, the specific yeah. theology. Great. It it didn't it, it it hasn't happened for me, and I'm honest about that. But but I have much more respect for my Christian brothers and sisters than I did before finding Doctor Peterson. Amen. It's not it's not my path right now, but but I have much more respect for it. And to take it, uh, I have developed a deeper. I mean, obviously, there's a deeper respect for religion overall. Like it's almost we can't. We are like the the our consciousness and our mythology are very intertwined. I don't think you can separate the two. Um, you know, I, I'm my girlfriend was raised Islamic. And I've developed a deep appreciation for Islamic culture as well. That you know, there's a book in the Quran um, titled Mary. Right, it's about the mo- the mother of Christ. Um, Christ in a lot of Christian, I didn't know this when I was growing up in, you know, Christian Tennessee, Christ is a prophet in the Quran, right? We're, the, the general notion that was held out to me, I don't know where I got this, if this was mainstream media or what, but it was like, these religions are somehow antagonistic. Couldn't be further from the truth, right? Like Christ is in the Quran. He's held out like all of his teachings. Like he's a, he's a great figure. and um Again, the the and then learning a little bit, you know, mostly through a film I watched. Is, it's a 1970s film. I think it's called The Messenger, and it's about the Prophet Muhammad's life. But consistent with Islam, you know, you're not supposed to create depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. So in the movie, he's never depicted. You only ever see through his eyes, like it'll show like what he was seeing in a moment, but you never you never see him. And so it's kind of an interesting cinema cinematographic cinematography an instrument means of cinematography to sort of honor that um aspect of of islamic tradition and what i learned there is like a lot of the his teachings parallel christ's teachings so it's all of this is very there's a paradoxical thing here where it's like jbp's language and maps of meaning i think really speaks to the mind of the rational atheist Right, like he's describing the value of all of these mythologies to the rational atheist, and then in in doing so, telling the rational atheist that you are also a religious animal. You have just called your, a- your atheism as your god, right? Yeah, and you know what? I think that's where I landed. Right, was that okay? I'm okay with knowing and understanding that I am. I have this religious programming, and mm-hmm. I think of the world this way. And and I've I've sort of stopped there and just started working, yeah. Full stop on on whatever as you should. <laughs> well, sure, and we all should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but but the but the thing is that isn't to devalue any anyone's anyone's religion. Uh, I I think I even just say, do whatever it takes to get yourself working, That's and right. I mean that on many levels. Yes, working on the men, from the mental health perspective yes. and working on stuff doing yes. things that that move you forward give you meaning yes bring value to society all of that no i love that so accepting who you are where you come from latent programming explicit programming whatever accepting all of it taking responsibility for yourself all you know good bad and ugly all things considered and then getting yourself working right both in sense of getting yourself motivated getting yourself functional, right? Competent. Um, and getting yourself, I guess, consistent would be another one, right? It's like, be contri- be contributing to others. That's where you're going to get meaning in your own life. And that's where you're going to add value to the lives of others. So it's like, whatever, yeah, whatever story you need to tell yourself <laughs> to get yourself working in those ways, by all means. Ah, uh, hey, I... <laughs> I think this is a fantastic line under this thing because it's it just again shows how great this this material is and the funny thing is we're not even done. We've we've yeah. got 
uh, this is up to page 306 in my version and chapter five goes from 307 to 471 it's like <laughs> a third of the book so we're not even done <laughs> yeah crazy coming up but yes. I, think, I think this chapter has been a lot of fun so i, I don't have anything uh it, the the very last paragraph of the chapter might be fun to read uh, because it sort of emphasizes this um this point of uh uh losing paradise but it's sort of a it's sort of a pessimistic end and i, I think we're on this mm. optimistic tear so i don't know what you think about that Are you talking about the, what? it's my 306 is the very end of the chapter what what uh, um yeah so the very last your paragraph end or something like that very very last why, why hide, hide from god yeah you gotta read it it's good all right all right all right it says uh and it's yeah okay optimism pessimism like that's what this is all about it's dealing with both of them right you don't want to be too excessively optimistic you don't want to be too excessively pessimistic we want to navigate the middle way the concluding excerpt and this is chapter four why hide from god because knowledge of vulnerability makes us shrink from our own potential to live fully is to risk to risk everything to risk death why hide from God? How under such conditions could we not hide? Survival has become terror and endless toil, necessitating discipline, compelled by burdensome wisdom, rife with interest psychic conflict, motivated by anxiety, instead of spontaneous natural activity. We remain eternally hung on the cross of our own vulnerability. The creation and fall of man is portrayed schematically in Genesis and Descent. Sorry, that was talking about the picture. But there's a picture there. I think he updated these pictures in his next... He's going to do like a republication of this because the, the pictures, oh, great. they're useful, but they could definitely use a little um, aesthetic upgrade. No, you're right. But I really enjoy the pictures. And I mean, the um, at, at least if you understand what he's getting at, they kind of build on each other kind of thing. Yes. But, but this last paragraph, I mean, there's so there's so much here, right? It's 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 humility, understanding our own vulnerability. There's danger in life. Putting yourself out there is risky. Mm. You risk everything. You risk death. But the entire rest of the chapter talks about why that's worth it. And so, I mean, hey, it's uh, live life live life humbly, but with the intention of doing great things mm. be willing to risk it i think that's what that's saying it. i love yeah. it um i love i don't know where this comes from this might be musashi the way of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death like if you do things in the context of well you only live once and you're what did uh, marcus aurelius say that no man lives any other life which he now loses or loses any other life which he now lives it's like you're you're in it right now, buddy. Get to work. <laughs> Get to work. Perfect. Beautiful. I don't have anything else. I think I think I think that was awesome. Draws a perfect line under it. And we'll stop at chapter four for today. I think so. Okay. Luke, man, this is so damn fun. I agree. I'm having a blast. <laughs> Looking forward to the next one. Yeah, likewise. I hope people are getting some uh, some value out of this, and then I, by all means, encourage you to engage with the text. It is we're barely touching it, by the way. We read like what five excerpts in three hours, and we talk about so we're talking about five paragraphs for three hours a shot. I mean, this is a six hundred page book. It's um, pretty good. Right? There's yeah. a lot here. There's a lot here. And if you don't mind my uh, my saying, if anyone wants to know a little bit more about this uh, this Norse mythology stuff, all the way back in 2018, I talked about that one poem that I ended with for eight hours, and there's there's more content on on that. I don't get anything out of this show anymore. I stopped doing it three years ago, but it's called the Northern Myths Podcast, and you can you can find it if you you find me on the social media and all that. It's only on YouTube now, so if you're if you're curious. You said you were going to end with an outside quote. Ah, yeah. Well, it was the it was the one we um, we let's, we let's hit. hit let's hit it again. Let's hit it again. Repetition is the father of learning. Cattle die, kinsmen die, 
all men are mortal, but I know one thing that never dies, the glory of the great dead. Papa Mall 77. Beautiful place to end it. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>